Hello class and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured Chapter 37 Transport Operations Lecture. We will be covering EMS operations, knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personal safety, including risk and responsibilities of emergency response and of transport, also air medical, safe air medical operations, and utilizing air medical response. Applying fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Also how to decontaminate equipment after treating a patient and how to decontaminate the ambulance and equipment after treating a patient. A little bit of background. So horse-drawn ambulances were used in major U.S. cities as far back as the 1700s. Then U.S. hospitals started using their own ambulance services in the late 1860s. And ambulance attendants often traveled with limited medical supplies. Now, in today's ambulances, they're stocked with standard medical supplies. Many are equipped with even state-of-the-art technology that you could transmit data directly to the emergency department. Today's emphasis is on rapid response, and it, it places the EMTs in greater danger while driving to calls. Although technology can aid in directing the route and mode of response of the ambulance, it also can be distracting and potentially places the crew at a higher risk for crashes. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about emergency vehicle design. So an, ambul an ambulance is a vehicle that is used for treating and transporting patients who need emergency medical care to the hospital. The first use of a motor-powered ambulance occurred in late 1800s. Today's ambulances are designed based on NFPA 1917 which is the standard for automotive ambulances and on suggestions from the ambulance industry and from EMS personnel. So NFPA stands for the National Fire Protection Association and the number is 1917. An enlarged patient compartment is one of the most significant developments. First responder vehicles also respond initially to the scene with personnel and equipment to treat the sick and injured until an ambulance can arrive. So components of a modern ambulance include a driver's compartment, a patient compartment big enough for two EMTs, and two supine patients, equipment and supplies to provide emergency medical care at the scene and during transport, two-way radio communication, design and construction to ensure maximum safety and comfort. This table shows the basic ambulance designs. There are three types. Each state establishes its own standards for ambulance licensing licensing and certification. Many states use federal specifications. Notice to the left, it's the Star of Life emblem. It identifies vehicles as ambulances, and it is often affixed to the sides, rear, and roof of the ambulance. Local and state regulatory authorities determine which emblem may be displayed on the side of a pre-hospital care ambulance. These figures show the different types of ambulances. Okay, so this shows the different phases of a call. An ambulance call has nine separate phases. The preparation for the call, dispatch, en route, Arrival to the scene, transfer the patient to the ambulance, 
en route to the receiving facility, which is basically transport, and at the receiving facility, which is the delivery of the patient, en route to the facility, and then finally post-run. Now we're going to break those down even further and talk about them individually. So your first phase of the ambulance call is the preparation phase. Many would say this is the most important phase of the call. Um, this is when you make sure the equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. If items are missing or do not work, they are of no use to you or your patient. So new equipment should be placed on the ambulance only after proper instruction on its use and consulting with the medical director, of course. Uh, equipment and supplies should be durable and standardized. Also, store equipment and supplies according to how urgently and how often they are used. Items for life-threatening conditions at the head of the primary stretcher. Items for cardiac care, eternal bleeding, and blood pressure at the side of the stretcher. Cabinets and drawer fronts should be transparent or labeled. Should easily open and close securely. Medical equipment, basic supplies such as uh, disposable gloves and sharps, airway and ventilation equipment, basic wound care supplies, splinting, childbirth supplies, um, automated external defibrillators, patient transfer equipment, medications, communication equipment, airway and ventilation equipment, and on and on and on. Uh, one portable and one mounted suction unit, large bore suction tubing, uh, portable oxygen supply, mounted oxygen unit, CPR equipment, CPR board, uh, basic wound care supplies, trauma shears, gauze, abdominal, sterile, universal trauma dressing, tourniquets, adhesive bandages. To continue the medical equipment, there will also be splinting supplies, such as adult and child traction splints, arm and leg splints, including vacuum, cardboard, wire, ladder splints, roller bandages, short backboards, long backboards, cervical collars, which are adjustable sizes and variable sizes, child birth supplies, such as OB kits and AED. Also, don't forget, you'll need a ambulance stretcher. And this ambulance stretcher is required to be secured firmly to the floor or side of the ambulance during transport. It's also required to have at least three restraining devices for the patient and also, it, your ambulance could could include uh, scoop stretchers or folding stretchers, flexible stretchers or basket type stretcher, uh, wheeled stair chair or long backboards or short backboards or short immobilization devices. You could have medications, appropriate medications that have not expired. Also, you Ambulances could carry jump kit. Um, a jump kit is a portable, durable, often waterproof. It's a five minute kit, which carries anything needed in the first five minutes with the patient. Typically, the contents include disposable gloves, face shields, triangular bandages, trauma shears, adhesive tape, universal trauma dressings or OPs, BVM, blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes, pen lights, sterile dressing, sterile um, dressings such as abdominal pads, adhesive strips, oral glucose, activated charcoals, and other medications. The preparation phase also includes safety and operational equipment. It includes several kinds of equipment for responder safety, rescue operations, and locating emergency scenes, personal safety equipment, including face shields, gowns, shoe coverings, and caps, turnout gear, helmet with face shields and safety goggles, safety shoes or boots, no hazardous materials gear, reserve, uh, 
Hazmat gear is refers, reserved for hazmat technicians or special response teams. Equipment for work areas, though, such as uh, waterproof compartments, um, which will be located outside, uh, warning devices that flash or have reflectors, two high-intensity recharging battery-powered stand-up Halligan candle flashlights, ABC fire extinguishers, dry chem or five-pound minimum, hard hats or helmets with face shields, and portable floodlights. Also in the preparation phase is preparing and navigating. So GPS devices and MDTs are standard equipment in modern ambulances. However, you want to know um, and familiarize yourself with the roads and traffic patterns in your own city. So plan alternate routes that uh, you frequent destinations. Be familiar with special facilities and locations within your regional operating area. Also extrication equipment, location in a waterproof compartment uh, outside the patient compartment. It contains equipment that is needed for a single light extrication, even if the extrication and rescue unit is readily available. Um, table 37.5 lists the items that should be included in that compartment. Personnel. So at least one EMT in the patient compartment at all times during transport. Two EMTs is strongly recommended. And some services allow non-EMT drivers with two EMTs in the patient compartment. Another very important part of the preparation phase is performing a daily inspection. And this includes checking fuel and oil transmission and all fluid levels, engine cooling, batteries, brake fluid, engine belts, uh, inflation pressure of the wheels and tires, and any signs of unusual or uneven wheel wear, all interior or exterior lights, windshield, wipers and fluid, horn and sirens, the air conditioner, heaters and ventilation systems, the ability of the doors to open and close and latch and lock properly, communication systems, vehicle and portable, cleaning and positions of all the windows and mirrors. You're inspecting the cleanliness, quality, and function of the medical equipment and supplies. You're looking at the oxygen supplies, jump kits, splints, dressing and bandages, backboards and other immobilization equipment, the emergency OB kit, and all battery operating equipment. Also, safety precautions. You need to review standard traffic safety rules and regulations. Make sure safety devices such as seat belts are working properly. Oxygen tanks must be secured and fixed, clasped or housed. And all equipment in the cab, rear, and compartments must be secured appropriately. Okay, and so next this brings us to the dispatch phase. The dispatch phase must be easy to access and in service 24 hours a day. It may be operated by local EMS or by a shared service with law enforcement and the other fire department. The dispatch center might serve only one jurisdiction or might be an area or regional center. The dispatch should gather and record. So they're gonna gather and record the nature of the call, the caller's name, present location and callback number, the exact location of the patients, which is most important, the number of the patients and the severity of their conditions and other pertinent information. En route to the scene, in many ways, the en route to the scene phase is the most dangerous phase for the EMTs. Crashes cause many serious injuries. So make sure that the fasten seatbelts and shoulder harnesses before even moving the ambulance. Review dispatch information, prepare to assess and care for the patient, assign specific duties and scene management tasks, and decide which equipment should be taken initially. Arrival at the scene. So if you are first to arrive on scene, you will perform what's called a scene size up and give a brief radio report of your findings to dispatch. You'll use the following guidelines. 
So you look for safety hazards to yourself, your partner, bystanders, and the patient. You'll evaluate the need for additional units. You'll determine the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. You'll evaluate the need for spinal immobilization and you'll follow standard precautions. This should all sound familiar. For mass casualty incidents, establish and communicate the number of patients to the incident commander. Request additional units through dispatch. The incident command system will be established, defining each responder's roles and responsibilities. Safe parking. So when you arrival on the, at the scene, safe parking is essential. This is very important. Pick a position that will allow for efficient traffic control and flow of the emergency scene. The first vehicle to arrive should park at least 100 feet before or past the crash to create a barrier between the EMTs and tra traffic. Do not park alongside a scene. I repeat, do not park alongside a scene. You may block the movement of other vehicles. So park uphill, or upwind of a scene with smoke or hazardous materials, uphill and upwind. Leave your warning lights on and devices. Keep a safe distance between your vehicle and operations at the scene. This figure shows safe parking distances for the ambulances. Stay away from fires, explosive hazards, down wires, and unstable structures. Set the parking brake. Park as close to the scene as possible to facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. If it is necessary to block traffic to un unload equipment or load patients, do so quickly and safely. Traffic control. Only when all patients have been treated and the emergency situation is under control should you be concerned with restoring the flow of traffic. Traffic control is intended to ensure an orderly traffic flow, warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. As soon as possible, place warning devices, such as reflectors, or both sides on both sides of the crash. The transfer phase. In most cases, excessive speed is unnecessary and dangerous and may prevent the provider in the back of the ambulance from rendering appropriate care as well as alarming the patient. So use common sense and defensive driving techniques. The patient must be packaged for transport. Secure the patient to a backboard scoop stretcher or wheeled ambulance stretcher. Properly lift the patient into the patient compartment. Secure the patient with at least three straps across the body. Use deceleration or stopping straps over the patient's shoulders, especially if the patient is laying flat or secured to a backboard. The transport phase. Provide dispatch with the following information when you're ready to leave the patient the number of patients, the name of the receiving hospital or the hospital you are going to, and the beginning mileage of the ambulance. Monitor the patient's condition and route. And of course, recheck a stable patient's vital signs every 15 minutes and recheck the unpatient, unstable patient's vital signs every five. Contact the receiving facilities, the receiving hospital facility. Do not abandon the patient emotionally. Be aware of the patient's level of need. The delivery phase. So inform dispatch as soon as you arrive at the hospital. Report your arrival to the triage nurse or other arrival personnel. Physically transfer the patient. Present the complete verbal report. Complete a detailed patient care report, which, is in, which includes history of the current illness or injury, pertinent positive and negatives, nature of illness or mechanism of injury, relative past medical or surgical history, medical uh, medications and allergies, pre-hospital treatment and its effects, and after transferring the patient, it may be possible to restock items used during the call, such as oxygen masks, dressings, and bandages. And then you're en route to the station. 
Inform dispatch whether you are in service and where you will be going. As soon as you are back to the station, you need to clean and disinfect the ambulance and equipment if you have not already done so at the hospital. Restock the supplies if you have not already done so at the hospital. In the post-run phase, complete and file additional written reports, inform dispatch again of status and location and availability, perform routine inspections, and refuel the vehicle if needed. Key terms to understand. There is a difference between cleaning, disinfection, high-level disinfection, and sterilization. Understand that cleaning is the process of removing dirt, dust, blood, or other visible contaminants from the surface of equipment. Disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by directly applying a chemical made for that purpose. High level disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by the use of potent means of disinfection. And sterilization is a process such as use of heat that removes all microbacterial contamination. After each call, perform the following regimen. Strip all linens from the stretcher and replace them in a plastic bag or receptacle. Discard medical waste, such as disposable equipment used for patient care during the call, in an appropriate receptacle. Wash decontaminated areas with soap and water. Disinfect all disposable equipment used for patient care during the call. Clean the stretcher with an EPA registered germicidal or vericidal solution or bleach and water at a 1 to 100 dilution. Clean spillage or other contamination with, a, with the same germicidal or vericidal solution or bleach water solution. Create a schedule for a routine full cleaning of the emergency vehicle. Refer to the manufacturer's recommendations to create a written policy procedure for cleaning each piece of the equipment. Defensive ambulance driving techniques. According to the National Highway Safety Administration, between 1992 and 2011, there were approximately 4,500 motor vehicle crashes involving an ambulance each year. Some of these accidents were fatal. An ambulance involved in a crash delays patient care at a minimum and, at worst, may take the lives of the EMTs, other motorists, or pedestrians. You are strongly encouraged to participate in a certified defensive driving program before attempting to operate an emergency vehicle. Driver characteristics. In some states, some states require drivers to successfully complete an approved emergency vehicle operations course. Physical fitness and alertness are necessary to operate an emergency vehicle. You should not be driving if you take medications that cause you to be drowsy or slow your reaction time or you have been drinking alcohol. You should have or you have been working long shifts or multiple consecutive shifts. Notify your employer if you have worked a shift previously and feel you may be unable to safely operate an emergency vehicle. Emotional maturity and stability are necessary to operate under stress. You cannot drive in any manner that pleases or simply, simply because you have lights and sirens on. You must operate the vehicle with due regard for safety and others and preservation of property. Safe driving practices. Speed does not save lives. Good care does. All drivers and passengers must wear their seat belts and shoulder restraints at all times. If you remove your seat belt to provide care, fasten it again as soon as possible. 
unrestrained and improperly restrained patients and equipment may become airborne during a collision. Become familiar with how your emergency vehicle accelerates, corners, sways, and stops under various conditions. Make sure you understand the vehicle's parking character braking characteristics and best downshifting techniques in a multi-lane highway stay in the extreme left which is the fast lane allowing other motorists to move over to the right lane when they see or hear you approach siren risk benefit analysis so the decision to activate the emergency lights and sirens will always depend on several factors these factors include local protocols the patient's condition and the anticipated clinical outcome of the patient driver anticipation Always assume that motorists around your vehicle have not heard your sirens, address uh, sirens or public address systems, or seen you until unless proven otherwise. If the motorist yields the right of way, the emergency vehicle operator should attempt to establish eye contact with the other driver. Look at the direction of the other driver's front tires to get an early indication of which way it will turn. Always drive defensively. Cushion safety. Maintain a safe following distance from the vehicle in front of you and try to avoid being tailgated from behind. Ensure that blind spots in your vehicle's mirrors do not prevent you from seeing vehicles or pedestrians on either side of the ambulance. To distance yourself from a tailgater, slow down or contact the local police. Never get out of the ambulance to confront the driver. Three blind spots around the ambulance include rear view mirror creates a blind spot in front of the driver. Rear of the vehicle cannot be seen fully through the mirror and side of the vehicles. Scan your mirrors frequently for any new hazards and use the spotter and predetermined hand signals when backing up the ambulance. Excessive speed. Excessive speed is unnecessary, dangerous, and does not increase the patient's chance of survival. It makes it difficult for EMTs to provide care in the patient compartment. It hinders the driver's reaction time and increases the time and distance needed to stop the ambulance. Siren syndrome. This causes drivers to drive faster in the presence of sirens due to increased anxiety. Although the siren signifies a request for drivers to yield the right away, drivers do not always do so. Vehicle size and distance judgment. So awareness of emergency vehicle size and weight improve the driver's ability to maneuver and judge distance. Crashes often occur when the vehicle is backing up. Allow use some always use someone outside the ambulance as a ground guide when you are backing up to avoid any incidents. Vehicle size and weight greatly influence braking and stopping distances. Road positioning and cornering. Road positioning means the position of the vehicle on the road relative to the inside or outside edge of the paved surface. Keep the ambulance in the proper lane when turning a corner. Enter high in the lane to the outside and exit low to the inside. Weather and road conditions. Okay, so ambulances have a longer braking time and stopping distance. The weight of an ambulance is unevenly distributed which it makes it it takes it a lot makes it more prone to roll over so be alert you have to for changing weather road and driving conditions hydroplaning at speeds of greater than 30 miles an hour a tire can lift off the road and the road it piles up under it the vehicle may feel then feel as if it's floating if hydroplaning 
hydroplaning occurs, you should gradually slow down without jamming on the brakes. So any speeds of greater than 30 miles an hour, you can hydroplane. Water on the roadway, wet brakes will not slow the vehicle as, efficient, as efficiently as dry brakes. So avoid driving through large pools of standing water, avoid driving through moving water. Decrease visibility in areas where there's fog, smoke, snow, or heavy rain. Slow down after warning cars behind you. Always use headlights during the day. Watch carefully for stopped or slowing vehicles, ice or slippery surfaces. Good all weather tires and appropriate speed will reduce traction problems significantly. Consider using snow tires or tire chains if the law permits. Rules and regulations. Although emergency vehicle drivers are exempt from normal vehicle operations during a call, certain laws and regulations must be followed. Motor vehicle crashes account for a large number of lawsuits against EMS personnel and, and services. If you are on an emergency call, you are using your warning lights and sirens, you may be allowed to do the following. You may be allowed to park or stand in an otherwise illegal location, proceed through a red light or stop sign, but never without stopping first. So that's the key. You have to stop first. You may be allowed to drive faster than the posted speed limit. You may be allowed to drive against the flow of traffic on a one-way street or make a turn that is normally illegal, and you may travel left of center to make an otherwise illegal pass. But this is all, 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 if you're using due care. An emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass a school bus that has stopped to load or unload children and is displaying the flashing red lights or exceed extended stop arm. Use of warning lights and siren is governed by three basic principles. The unit must be on a true emergency call. Both audible and visual warning devices must be used simultaneously and the unit must be operated with due regard for safety of way privileges. Emergency vehicles have the right to disregard the rules of the road when responding to an emergency. In doing so, the operator of the emergency vehicle must not endanger people or properly property under any circumstances. Get to know your local right-of-way privileges and exercise them only when it is absolutely necessary for the patient's well-being. Use of escorts. Use of police escorts as a guide only when you are in an unfamiliar territory. Neither vehicle should use its warning lights or sirens. If you are being guided, follow at a safe distance. Intersection hazards. Intersection crashes are the most common and usually the most serious type of collision in which the ambulances are involved involved. Always be alert and careful when appropriate approaching intersections. If you are on an urgent call and cannot wait for the lights to change, come to a brief stop at the light and check for other motorists and pedestrians before proceeding. Highways. Shut down emergency lights and sirens until you have reached the far left lane. Unpaved roads. Take special care. Operate the vehicle at a lower speed and maintain a firm grip on the steering wheel and school zones. Remember, it is unlawful for an emergency vehicle to exceed the speed limit in a school zone regardless of the condition of the patient. Distractions. While the ambulance is in motion, focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards. Minimize distractions. Mobile dispatch terminals and GPS, mounted mobile radios, stereos, cell phones, and eating and drinking. Driving alone. When driving alone, it is your responsibility to focus on figuring out the safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Such, situ such, 
such situations demand your complete attention and focus. Fatigue. Recognize when you are fatigued and alert your partner or supervisor. If you are feeling fatigued, you should be placed out of service for the remainder of the shift or until the fatigue has passed and you feel capable of operating the vehicle safely. Air Ambulance Operations Air ambulances are often used to evacuate medical and trauma patients. There's two specific types. There's fixed wing units are used for interhospital patient transfers over distances greater than 100 to 150 miles. And rotary wing units such as helicopters are used efficient for shorter, shorter distances. Specially trained crews accompany air ambulance flights. The, MT du the MT's duties are limited to providing ground support. Familiarize yourself with the capabilities, protocols, and methods for assessing helicopters in your area. Helicopters, medical evacuation operations, medical evacuations, medevac is performed exclusively by helicopters. Medevac capabilities, protocols, and procedures vary between EMS systems calling for medevac. So why would you call for medevac? There's specific reasons. So the transport time to the hospital for ground is too long considering the patient's condition. Possibly road traffic or environmental conditions provide the use of, um, prohibit the use of a ground ambulance. The patient requires advanced care beyond the EMT capabilities, such as pain management, maybe, or airway insertion. There are multiple patients who will overwhelm the resources at the hospital reached by the ground transport. So who receives medevac? Patients with time-dependent injuries or illness. Patients suspected of having a stroke, heart attack, or serious spinal injuries. Perhaps patients who are found in remote areas, such as scuba diving injuries or drownings, skiing or wilderness injuries. Maybe trauma patients or candidates for limb replantation, a burn center possibly, or hyperbaric chamber, or maybe a venomous bite center. So who could call one? Generally, the dispatcher should be notified first. In some regions, EMS may be able to communicate with the flight crew after initiating a medevac request. So establishing a landing zone. So this is interesting and very important to pay attention to. The safest and most effective way to land and take off is similar to that used by fixed wing aircraft. Landing at a slight angle allows for safe operations. Establishing a landing zone is the responsibility of ground EMS crew. So an appropriate landing site should be a hard or grassy level surface, 100 by 100, but no less than 60 by 50. Clear all the loose debris, such as branches or trash bins. Clear overhead or tall hazards. It should be clear of overhead or tall hazards, such as power lines or cables or trees. Mark the distance using weighted cones or positioning emergency vehicles uh, with the headlights facing inward to form an X. Never use caution tape or ask people to mark the site and do not use flares. Move non-essential persons or vehicles to a safe distance outside the landing zone. Communicate the direction of strong wind to the flight crew, they may request that you create some form of wind directional device to, to aid their approach. Landing zone safety and patient transfer. Stay away from the helicopter and go only where the pilot and crew member directs you. Keep a safe distance from the aircraft whenever it is on the ground and hot, which means the helicopter blades are still spinning. Stay outside the landing zone perimeter unless directed to come to the aircraft by the member of the flight crew. If you are asked to enter the landing zone, stay away from the tail rotor. The tips of the blades move so rapidly they are invisible. Always approach the helicopter from the front, if, even if it is not running. I repeat, always approach the helicopter from the front, even if it is not running.
When you approach the aircraft, walk in a crouch position. This figure shows the danger zone surrounding the helicopter. Keep the following guidelines in mind when operating at the landing zone. Become familiar with your jurisdiction's helicopter hand signals. Do not approach the helicopter unless instructed and accompanied by the flight crew. Make sure that all patient care equipment and the patient are properly secured to the stretcher. Some helicopters may load patients from the side, whereas others are rear loading. Smoking and open flames and flares are prohibited within 50 feet of the aircraft at all times. Wear eye protection during approach and takeoff communications are going to be an issue. In your medevac request to prevent communications issues, include a ground contact radio channel and call sign of the unit and medevac should be in contact with. This figure shows hand signals used around helicopters. Special considerations, night landings. Do not shine spotlights, flashlights, or any other lights in the air to help the pilot. They may, they may become temporarily blind. Direct low intensity headlights or lanterns towards the ground at the landing site. Illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions if possible. Landing on uneven ground. If the helicopter must land on uneven ground, use extra caution. The main rotor blade will be even closer to the ground on the uphill side. Approach the aircraft from the downhill side only or as directed by the flight crew. Medevacs at hazmat incidents. Immediately notify the flight crew of the presence of a hazardous material at the site at the scene. Consult the flight crew and instant commander about the best approach and distance for the scene for the medevac. The landing zone should be uphill and upwind from the med from the hazmat scene. Properly decon patients before la loading them onto the helicopter. So uphill and upwind. Med evac issues. Factors that influence decisions to request the medvac. Assess, ass, assess the severity of weather and environment. Helicopters are typically unable to operate in severe weather conditions, such as thunderstorms, blizzards, and heavy wind, rain. Most helicopter services are limited to fly at 10,000 feet above sea level. Medevac helicopters fly between 130 and 150 miles per hour. Because of the cabin's confined space, assess the number and size of patients who can be safely transported in the medevac helicopter. Typically, medevac flights are extremely expensive compared to ambulance transports. The decision to request a medevac should not be based on the perceived ability of the patient to pay the bill, but rather on the medical necessity. We have now entered the review.